good morning everyone and uh, thank you all the panelists uh, for coming in and the organizers uh, and all the people who will be linking in to hear and go through this uh, session uh, we are basically focusing on evidence based medicine what can we do to enhance uh, standardization of care better clinical outcomes and uh, make patient safety uh, the core issue in ongoing clinical care um, I will request uh, uh, all the panelists just in couple of lines to introduce themselves and then we'll pose questions. I'll request all the panelists to keep the questions very brief. If there is any point which is to be added by any other panelists, please do come in before we go on to the next point. Uh, I'll begin with you, uh, Dr. Banerjee. Please just introduce yourself, then Harish and Rao. Hi, I'm Anish, here Bordhuman Hill City as an executive director and medical director of the organization. My sports specialization area is in emergency medicine, where I am also an examiner with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine too. As regards society affiliations, I work uh, as uh, secretary for the academic section of disaster medicine. I was one of the principal contributors for the National Hospital Safety Guidelines published by National Disaster Management Authority. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Harish Ramachandran. I am basically the country manager for uh, Walter's, Clinic, uh, Walter's Kluwer Clinical Effectiveness for India and all the neighboring countries. Uh, I come with 23, 24 years of experience in the industry of healthcare industry, starting my career from pharma and up to medical devices and others. Um, and one of the critical reasons where I just took over this role was basically the whole idea of evidence-based medicine and how that could change the landscape in India and I thought with that kind of an experience where I come in I can add and contribute and so looking forward for this conversation it's, it's uh, pretty close to my heart and to my role also as a as what I do in Walter School. Thank you sir. Wonderful. Rahul? Good morning sir I'm uh, Dr. Rahul Pandit I'm the director of critical care at Fortis Hospital Mumbai. I'm also the member of uh, Supreme Court appointed uh, task force for COVID-19 and Maharashtra government appointed task force for COVID-19. I'm a visiting consultant with two hospitals in Australia, and I also have academic uh, affiliation with the college there. Uh, so that's my introduction. Thank you. Wonderful. I will not waste time introducing myself. We will go straight into the discussion. Uh, my name is Dr. Sanjeev Bagai. I will post questions and please uh, keep the answers as brief, as crisp as possible. Uh, beginning with you, uh, Anish. Uh, how would you define evidence-based medicine in the present scenario 2021 going into 22, keeping standardization of care as our prime aim? Code of evidence-based medicine is evidence and the practice thereof. The definition has undergone a repeated changes. Uh, in terms of use in usage in terms of patient safety and how it can impact patient safety. There are very many ways that evidence-based medicine impacts patient safety. One good way of that is in terms of standardization, defining what is a standard and what is acceptable in terms of patient care. So I think the evidence-based, the major, major problem with evidence-based medicine, nobody looks at the evidence part of it. I agree with, uh, with Anish. We, we tend to sort of forget the evidence part of it and we just base our medicine on eminence and other things. So we need to understand that it is the core evidence which needs to be practiced. And anything apart from the evidence right now cannot be a standard of care. And we need to standardize our, our treatment protocols, our diagnostic protocols, our discharge protocols, our aftercare protocols based on whatever current evidence is there. There will it be is. a large lacunas, in, large lacunas in that. I completely agree with that. But those lacunas will have to be then filled with best practice guidelines. So I think uh, that's what we need to understand that there are two things. There's evidence-based medicine and there will be best practice guidelines. Uh, we should not be deviating beyond these two pillars right now. <clears throat> I agree with you. Harish? I, I think I completely I, you know, agree with what both Dr. Harish and Dr. Rahul mentioned. I think evidence-based medicine, the word itself coins it out. It's purely based on evidence and the amount of relief evidence also which is available. I think COVID was a very good testimonial to us. Very uh, uh, different circumstances, things started changing in. I think being up to date on the evidence, what's available and which is truly evident, I think that's critical. And so I believe uh, in agreement with both Ra Dr. Rahul and Dr. Anish, that's where I would keep looking at it. Uh, so question to each one of you all. Uh, keeping the two pillars of what we call as what is the latest evidence 
Uh, and point number two is keeping uh, the latest protocols as far as the guidelines are concerned. Each speciality, and there are more than 40 odd specialities in India, have associations and, and various chambers and uh, uh, societies uh, like nephrology, cardiology, emergency medicine, pediatrics, and gynae, and orbs, and so on. And then, of course, the, each hospital, large hospital chains have their own guidelines. Why is the national association's guidelines not incorporated across the board in most hospitals? Anish? My observation, sir, most of my experiences have been gathered by working and developing rural hospitals across Bihar, West Bengal, and some parts of Odisha. So whatever I could gather from my previous experience as well as establishing this health city here is there is too much of dichotomy. By that I mean that we all as specialists need to respect the other specialty. There is only one clinical question, sir. If somebody is coming with a chest pain, does he need a marker? If he needs a marker, when he needs a marker? The cardiological society? The pulmonology society, the emergency medicine society, all have to speak on the same page. So cross-talking between the societies is the order of the time. And preferably also whenever government guidelines are formulated, there is a need for industry, academia, government connect. So multi-sectorial coordination, which fortunately we saw during COVID, is the need of the time, sir. Rahul, are most of the, the national societies of different specialties, guidelines, incorporated in most hospitals in your experience no unfortunately not sir i think yeah. uh, what we need to follow is the is the indian railway model so in yeah. the indian railway you have a you have ac first class two tire three tire up to a general compartment okay but the destination is same for everyone who is traveling you could give the same analogy to an airplane as well so the standardization should be such that the safety and co and evidence base remains uniform across the spectrum because we have a healthcare which starts from rural to these five star hospitals where we are working. So we need to have a standardization of care and that standardization only can come when the pall bearers of these societies are given the authority to implement the guidelines. Uh, we, all have, we all have worked abroad. I just uh, heard all of you introduce yourself. Uh, all of them actually come across from a system where there is a college of emergency medicine, college of nephrology, college of medicine, college of ICU which brings the guidelines, the government uh, considers those guidelines as sacrosanct. And those guidelines are then disseminated without any questions being asked because the formulation of those guidelines is done by the experts of that particular subject. I think that's the system we need to put in place. Uh, Indian railway model where entire healthcare spectrum should be, should be uh, sort of uh, only divided on the terms of comfort, which is given in the hospital, but the standardization of care should be still there. Agreed with you. Harish, what can be done to make sure that most of the clinicians uh, follow the Indian railway model or the Indian airline model and get rid of the stubborn bullock model, which is uh, obsolete in, in a lot of places? I'll probably uh, take this point from a technology standpoint, uh, being an industry right. partner. Uh, so I think the biggest challenge, which was, is very clear, is I think when we said evidence-based, we we there are a lot of technology today available which support this. Now, the most important thing is available, availability at the point of care, at the type, place where you want to use it. And it's not for one person alone, but it's the entire spectrum of care providers, I would say. So whether it is a physician inside or a nurse, a clinical pharmacist, everybody. I think once there is a uh, clinical decision kind of a support or evidence-based medicine available, getting that to them at the place where they can use it and part of the clinical workflow, like what Dr. Rahul and Dr. Arish were mentioning, I think if that workflow and if you can integrate it as a culture inside, that would be the first space where this would start off getting adopted. And it will also become an institution wide culture. That's what my thought would be. I have got only one additional observation to make. There are two impediments to implementation of this care in smaller setups. You see, when we make ideal, we look at ideal. Most of India, there are two countries inside India, India and Bharat. What is practiced in Delhi or Kolkata is seldom practiced in a small town like Jamtara. It doesn't happen. 
the entire care ecosystem is different. So we as societies, I have often time heard about this in the emergency medicine societies. We must look at these like a disaster management system. So what is the minimum basic benchmark? So somebody comes with a chip, they get a streptokine as if there's a solution. So defining those kind of stuff, looking at multiple models of care is probably important when we are looking at such guidelines if we want to ensure higher adoptions, sir. Keeping in mind that uh, almost 75% of Indian healthcare is private and in that private, I would say more than 70% is, is unstructured or poorly structured in the, in the sense a uh, vast majority of the private uh, care is in smaller nursing homes, <clears throat> smaller polyclinics, uh, some uh, hospital setups are four beds, eight beds, 10 beds, 20 beds. And uh, it, it is, uh, it's a roll-in model. Uh, people come, admit their patients and they go. There are practically no full times. Uh, there is, uh, the staff is uh, at the bare minimum, very often at night, uh, poorly managed. Uh, how are these places going to come under the gamut of a basic minimum care in terms of standardization, point number two, safety, and point number three, implementations of protocol. I'll begin with you, Rav. So, sir, um, I think uh, with all these negative points which we which we just talked about, which need yeah. to be improved upon, there are a lot of positive points about our system, sir. You know, yeah. you can walk into a clinic and access medical care, which most uh, developed countries have almost forgotten that you can actually walk in and get a medical care unless it's a dire emergency. So that's a very big positive aspect of our care. Now, I think that it needs to start with implementation of medical boards in each state. Most of our states still do not have a full-time functioning medical board. I think they need to, we need to have a strong medical board which emphasizes on uh, continued medical education. I think that's the first thing. Maharashtra has started that. I'm sure there are other states who have done that. I may not be privy to the knowledge of that. But Maharashtra insists upon six MMC points to be generated every year for every five years accreditation to be improved. Now, that will probably improve over a period of time where, for example, I am a registered practitioner in Australia, the intensivist today. I have to fill in a large number of uh, forms every year to show that I have competencies in what I do as my core competencies. I've got competencies in terms of uh, my uh, mortality and mor morbidity uh, reviews and meetings. I've got competencies in terms of uh, people being uh, peers who have sort of uh, approved my practices and stuff. I think that's when that's when you actually reach to a holistic system. To reach to that point, we may take another decade, but it has to roll somewhere, sir. It has to start somewhere. And I think it is the time now. COVID is the time now to actually get this ball rolling. We need to establish this and say that in COVID, there were so many widespread practices. We don't need to go into that details, but we need to get it under one umbrella. Each state is an autonomous healthcare system, healthcare body. And actually, strides should implement that. Is Dr. Paul joined in as yet? Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Anish, with the background of what Rahul explained, why is accreditation in terms of maintaining standardization of care, technology, patient safety, not being made mandatory to get licenses to have healthcare facilities to be approved? Sir. While drafting the National Disaster Management Guide, Hospital Safety Guideline, we had, if you go through the Hospital Safety Guideline of NDMA, it has been repeatedly harped. We also ensured that the industry collateral from the Quality Council also joins there. You see, sir, uh, in ABH and these, these manuals, protocols that we talk of, they come out only during the NABH inspection. The moment an ABH inspection happens, everything yeah. goes under the carpet. Sorry, I am not diplomatic. I am clearly speaking about it. Yeah. This has to be a culture. This has to be a way of life. Sir. <laughs> Checklists. Dr. Gawande had written that book many years back. Yeah. We are yet struggling with checklists. We do not have defined realistic quality guidelines. Sir, forget quality minimum benchmarks. If you have a year, you must check that. Minimum basic bare, bare benchmarks. So I believe there is a time where government probably needs to reinforce this. Only merely limiting the TPA or CGHS payment mechanism yeah. with the NABH is not probably enough. That is my okay. opinion on this. Okay. Dr. Paul, what can be done to reduce the huge concept of human errors, which is very often camouflaged, fudged, 
or tried to be covered up uh, in spite of it happening. So, morning everybody. My sincere apologies again. And I was listening in on the conversation that just ended a minute ago about NABH and why NABH and why not NABH. And I fully agree with that gentleman that this whole thing started out of ensuring quality, but now it has finally come down to a cone down point of just doing a third party assurance retrieval of money. So quality is under the carpet still. It's a masquerade for three days before the NABH. And then it's all over. So therefore, when we started the Henry Ford Health System run hospital in India, this is the first Henry Ford affiliated hospital in the country. When we started this, one of the earliest things that I did, and I was very vehement about that, is that we go completely paperless. Going back to paper files, digging through tons of paper material is next to impossible. Uh, I trained out of CMC and in CMC we used to have these monthly audits and those audits were Herculean. So first thing I did was to make the whole thing paperless. So when I was at a meeting, I was asked, how paperless are you? And I said, we strive to be penless. And today we are actually penless. You do a whole day's work without looking for your pen in your pocket. And I think that is a crucial step. I wouldn't say that's the only step, but retrieving your errors, looking back into the mistakes you've made, the easier it is, the quicker it is to fix. Okay. But it all starts with a culture of wanting to do the right thing. Now, this is where I would just use, I, I would probably end my statement with a small little uh, dash, which is, why were weights and measures brought into this world? If each of us had the civic sense to do the right thing, we did not have to have weights and measures. If I had sure. to give you one kilogram of sugar and you trusted me, you, I don't have to measure it, you don't have to measure it. That was a barter system in the olden days. Weights and measures and all these benchmarks came because we started to deliberately fall short. The system made us fall short. So we need to have checks and balances. And one way is to have a pay relatively paperless system or a completely painless system where click of a button, you know what the outliers are. Fair enough. Uh, Harish, if I ask you three important salient points where technology can make human errors decline. And in that backdrop, I must add, there's a WHO manual in 1990s, which uh, one of the chapters was there. It was written, to err is human. Uh, the third most leading cause of death in most Western countries till the recent past was human errors. Uh, and if a technology uh, like in from your company uh, can bring down human errors 12 folds lower, name three or four salient points which can be incorporated, which are easy to implement, which are at low cost, they can be scalable, uh, they can be sustainable across different hospitals, different chains. Please, over to you. Thank you, sir. I think a pretty large point, and I'd probably pick up some of those points which the other panelists also brought up. Um, sure. Now, let's step back for a minute and say technology. I think what technology can uh, do is it can fast track the adoption of evidence-based medicine as a hospital-wide culture. I think there were points which were mentioned by the other panelists, whether it is NABH, whether it is getting it, you're trying to talk about culture. And I think technology can literally drive that. And by driving that, what effectively you would be driving is delivering more accurate care or it aids in delivering more accurate care. And as a physician, when you look at it, everybody is striving to do it. How do we minimize those errors, which is what you were asking for? And I think with this, when you look at this whole uh, thing, I think it's a spectrum which starts off from being simple at one end to a complex. But typically we try to, I mean, it's always best to go towards the best end of it which is the highest end of spectrum so there are i mean at the the other end of spectrum if i have to say the best end you have automated patient uh, specific alerts uh, they, they can manage and arrest uh, the medication errors which you're talking about we have and it will be at the source and not a uh, post facto i would say and there are technology and uh, there is uh, there are tools available like medispan medispan is a product which does it now however let's also be practical to the fact like what 
Dr. Rahul mentioned about the Indian railways and others. There are some stuff which we could do, which could be small and it could be the starting point. It can be from simple things of like availability of a clinical decision support system at the point of care or not even going to a level of alerting, but having a clinical drug reference solution, which could be available at again at the place where they're using it. And when I say that, I also heard talking about various different clinics. We are at India where you have a small hospital to a biggest one. So in a small place where you could use it on mobile, and we also know connectivity can be a challenge, even in the biggest of the cities we have. So the content can be available. Technology today makes this content available both online and offline. So when you have it online and offline, that helps. And when you look at an institution-wide culture, it can be available in the entire hospital. Furthermore, I think one of the classic elements at VNABH, we do it during that time and then we go away. Can we find a way to integrate these solutions onto EMRs? And these are pretty much available. They can be starting from simple things like putting up a link in the EMR where you can click it. Or it can be more specific as in when you go by where it can be patient specific, his age, his gender and other stuff which going in. And in my opinion, the first step there would be again is to just give that idea of that this is the evidence available. The choice, of course, is left to the physician to make it because he is the best judge with the patient. The, the other care providers are also there. So I think these kind of technology are available. I'll probably pause here. I think Dr. Rahul also was okay. uh, raising his fingers. Sir. So, sir, I would like to add a point here that when we talk about uh, correcting errors or trying to identify errors, we need to understand to a very important point what uh, Dr. Banerjee just put in about checklist. If you look at a jumbo, there must be like four or five hundred checks a pilot and engineers do before the jumbo jet is being ready for a takeoff. Okay, let's look at a nurse giving an injection. Yes. There are at least 10 point checks or 15 point checks which a nurse actually has to undergo yes. right from uh, reading the prescription or somebody writing the prescription to actually the injection being given to the patient. And in the hospital, there must be thousands of checkpoints which have to happen, which are just so difficult. That's why technology comes into the place and that's why checklists are very, very important. And practice, practice, practice is going to make people perfect. But the problem with us, sir, is that we just don't have enough human beings to practice. So our, our problem, if we really have to go to the root of it, is that we need to quadruple the amount of nurses and double or triple the amount of doctors which we are going to produce today. So that over the next 10 years, this gap along with the technology will be bridged to a significant level and maybe the errors can come down. Most Western countries have adopted this policy. Right. Who could not produce doctors, they exported or imported doctors from other countries. We are actually exporting doctors to other countries and we are not able to retain them. We are not able to retain our good nurses. Every year, I'm sure all of you have trained nurses and every second year or third year, they go abroad and we start afresh. So how are we going to bridge this gap? It's never going to be a bridgeable gap at all. Uh, Anish, oh, what would be three or four key pointers in a hospital where you can track clinical outcomes? So let me refine that question. What would be the three or four key parameters which will determine monitoring and determining clinical outcomes? Sir, I would look at it more like three or four bare benchmarks. Yes, please go. Three or four bare, bare indicators. Yeah. Uh, I have always shown by one, surgical site infections. Yeah. Number one. Second thing is hospital acquired pneumonia oblique hospital acquired UTI. That is also itself per se a good thing to look at. The yeah. third one that I would say is medication errors. Estimation of medication errors. And fourth, to understand processes are functioning smoothly or not is to look at different turner to the discharge desk. So okay. these are the okay. four things that I usually take a look at. Rahul, what would be the four key points which you will be uh, topmost in your mind to enhance clinical outcomes? Sir, I'm a clinician. I don't have any role in the administration of the hospital. Sure. I'm a complete clinician. So I'm going to look from a clinician's point of view. The first thing, and I will purely go clinical. First point of first thing which I look at is what was my history taking at the admission and how does my discharge summary look? I think if I look at these two points, most of my patient errors will be identified here. You will yeah. come to know that patient came in with one problem on the history and what you actually did on discharge. And these two speak everything what, what happened into the, into the system completely. Totally. And there are a num number of other checkpoints which administrators 
latch on to i'm sorry i'm not trying to offend anybody here who is in that role but they may not be as important I as all of us are doctors start i believe uh, dr pandit all of us are physicians first so administration is something that came to us no no that's it so i think these two other things which i would look sir i can't see points. another two or three points to add to that i'm sure there are many but they don't matter to me i totally agree um, dr paul would you like to add something there yes sir yes sir thank you for this opportunity again um i think i am i am i play a dual role i am a clinician i operate and i am also executive director so i'm stuck between the two i get i get thrown at from all the sides yeah. so um now i fully agree with all of you one is that i think the most important thing is to be willing and able to acknowledge that i have made a mistake and to be willing to correct it and all these all these uh, uh products that we're talking about whether it is paperless or the up to date or the nurses uh, software that we recently bought in fact i think we were one of the earliest hospitals to get up to date up and running in two months of starting the hospital because i wanted to try and stop every possible loophole before we allow people to say i don't have that therefore i couldn't do it i don't have this and therefore i couldn't do it so we closed all the physical loopholes but i think the important thing especially when you look at some of the assessment systems across the world the key thing is to be willing to look into one self and ask yourself the question did i do the right thing the last time and to acknowledge the fact that yes i did in that case do i know what went wrong if i know fix it if i don't find out or ask somebody else so that the next time around you don't do the same thing again Fair i point. think that's one of the key things to moving forward human and i have very a beautiful statement to to err is human but to fix it is divine agree harish how can any system be implemented to reduce medication errors and uh, i must add without taking any names one of the uh, most important paths to decrease uh, medical legal uh, litigation and court cases against hospitals and doctors is to get rid of human errors and the vast majority of human errors are either medication errors or dose errors apart from what happens in the ot i mean those would be gross errors wrong limb <coughs> wrong side wrong surgery wrong name wrong patient of course and uh, there are some case examples um, uh, pan india in fact uh, not only in india but globally which have happened even recently but way back in 1990s mid 90s uh, there's a very famous uh, actually now being quoted uh, in various case studies and in the, in the medical legal uh, jurisdiction five year old prolonged fever diagnosed as typhoid a uh, pediatrician writes injection chloro handwritten the nurse read it as chloro for the first two days the third day the nurse in handing over because these were all handwritten errors and a lot of it still happens still recently misread it and misconstrued it as chloroquin so 250 mg iv diluted became 250 mg as bolus unfortunately the child arrested even more unfortunately for the child after 2 hours the child got resuscitated and thereafter the full story is history because the child is a pure living vegetative state uh brain dead with practically no functions living off bed sores and multiple hospitalizations no life no quality nothing uh what harish can we do to make dosing calculative errors down to zero uh i think it's a pretty big question and i think it i think everybody struggles to answer this but i th- i think again now like what i started probably at the beginning you can have it starting from a system which is completely incorporated into a hospital hospital which gives you an automatic patient specific alert so a- every drug which is chosen or uh, if there is any specific drug what uh, is being prescribed 
And if it is paperless, like what Dr. Paul was mentioning, you put a drug, automatically it should say it. But now when the alert comes in, it is coming from a drug standpoint. But I think the bigger or the smaller aspects or probably which has the highest, like the what the Pareto rule, which says, if you can fix those 20% of the problem, which leads to 80%, I would say quick ones, what you mentioned, drug interactions. And like what Dr. Rahul was mentioning, even a nurse getting to find a way to give the medication, does she have those resources at that place? Like what Dr. Paul had mentioned, if some person wants to do it and change it, do we give them that resource at that point of the time? And will they check it? Now, of course, it has to be brought together as a culture and it's whether it is from NABH or institutions policy. I think the formulary, hospital formulary, drug related policies has a big thing to do it. Now, whether it is not gov- whether it is governed by the government or whether it is made mandate or you put it on a hospital, I think technology comes and helps there definitely. Whether with the technology or without the technology, that can be driven definitely. There is no doubt about it. So, but technology today can aid. So you have formularies which are available. You have drug reference solutions available. Putting it together, getting it there, and activating all the care providers. It's not only the physicians because physicians is only one part. Like what you mentioned, there was a nurse there. How do we get the culture of a nurse going through when the prescription comes in? Can she look at it? Can she? Does she have access to that data? Also, she checks not only for the drug interactions, allergy, and I think as physicians and as um, even care providers, you're also talking today, a lot of talks about antibiotic stewardship and various elements. So I think there is enough in technology available. It's only the acceptance and to implement it, even from starting from the basic level. So there are clinical drug reference solutions which can be worked individually which means it can be seen on a mobile and whatever you do, but also can be integrated. If you want it to be, it can be integrated at the level of an EMR. And whenever a drug is prescribed, you just can't put, you don't need an alert because I think Dr. Rahul can probably as a critical care person can say how many wrong alerts and everything will make our lives much more tougher in place. You don't need to it. You can have a single icon at the next to it. Just click on that and you get the complete reference of the drug, including all the details of the photograph, the dosage, and the dosage <clears> also <throat> changes between one disease to another disease. It can be the same drug like what you mentioned, changes. Yeah. But again, all of them have to be backed with evidence. I think all of them are available. How do we implement it? Depends on the hospital, the setup, the place where we are, because we are in India and we are a white country with different challenges in different places. So I would say there are many available, but how do we do it is again a big subject to be taken. But I, I suppose we have, we should start somewhere. That's my thought. So, Dr. Paul, how, how would you implement, uh, especially in areas of emergency room, uh, cath labs, uh, OTs, post-op ICUs, medication errors to a zero tolerance means to bring it down to near nil, especially when doses like dopamine, epinephrine, digoxin, everything is milligram per kilogram per day, milligram per kilogram per hour in a sustained drip, or very often there are certain drugs which are co-reactive with certain other medications. There are some which have known side effects in a particular condition. There are some drugs which have to be dose modified depending upon the ongoing GFR or other clinical conditions. How is this system integrated so that your errors are reduced? Dr. Paul. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. So. We are nowhere near achieving a hundred per zero percent tolerance. We are nowhere near it. But we, what we've done in our EMR is to integrate the Indian formulary, which is available online for a, for at a price. So when, for example, I would probably use an example. You click on injection, let's say um, um, augmented injection augmented. You can only prescribe one or two or three different doses that are available on the formulary. And the moment you click on that, if that particular drug has an interaction with one of the other drugs that was chosen already, it throws up an alert. So what we did when we uh, fixed our EMR, ours is a completely homegrown software done by a major company called Cranium, but the whole thing is customized. So one of the things we made sure was that there was no free text to prescribe medications. So you cannot prescribe <coughs> injection <coughs> at 1,500 milligrams. 
or tab augmentin 625, only you can't prescribe 725. You have to pull, pull down a drop box. You have to choose from the available uh, medications available. And we have a pharmacotherapeutic committee, which very closely observes what brands get in. Uh, we don't stock like 50 brands of the same medicine. We only stock one original molecule and two generics. So that's all you can do. Free text is not recognized by the pharmacy. Okay. Anish, how do hospitals in terms of overall management implement not only committees, but the decision-making of committees like a medical audit or a clinical path cooperative meeting? How are these translated onto individual doctors and individual departments? That means sure. what is the learning curve of mortality meetings, uh, clinical radiology meetings, surgical meetings, uh, medical audit meetings, where each case should be discussed, dissected, and therefore the same mistake or the same error is not repeated. Or even better is if things can be done in a better and a smoother manner. Over to you, Anish. Sir, I will start with the least practiced, but something that we found the maximum benefit during COVID. It is the usual practice of journal clubs. We all would remember, uh, I'm sure Dr. Pandit would agree, how the management of COVID, particularly COVID-related ALI, ARDSS, evolved drastically throughout our learning curves during the COVID pandemic. So uh, I found that in our experience, uh, it was a wonderful learning because the moment people sit, dissect, understand, because sir, evidence is not evidence unless you have weighed the evidence unless you have understood the translatability of the evidence to your practice. So that is exactly what we did and we found it enormously humongously beneficial. Just to give another example in terms of mortalities, uh, we had a scrub typhus. Uh, that scrub typhus patient presented pretty late in sepsis. In spite of best possible efforts, patient couldn't be salvaged. But a discussion of that scrub typhus resulted in an increase in the diagnosis rate of scrub typhus, not only in my hospital, but also in surrounding hospitals to a significant extent. In another hospital, I'm talking almost a decade back, once we understood, once we explained clearly about the utility of D-dimers and who should get a CTPA, we found that pulmonary embolisms were detected and prevented. Finally, sir, in terms of cost, in my emergency room, we swear by the Canadian cispine rules, the Ottawa ankle rules, and the Ottawa knee rules. This reduces unnecessary X-rays. This reduces unnecessary CT scans in patients with injuries and traumas. So in my experience, sir, a peer review and a peer acceptance of the evidence and a discussion and corroborative approach is always better and it's has got a greater acceptability rather than imposing something directly from an administrative level. Perfect. So this is my observation on this, sir. Rahul? Sir, uh, I also had the pharmaceutical and therapeutic committee for the Fortis, entire Fortis group. And um, I can tell you the, the approach from top down never works. So we have to actually go down to each person. That's where uh, the point I was trying to make before, uh, I raised my hand, but it could not was the communication. So communication is a very, very crucial aspect, sir. You can make up thousands of community committees, but they will not work at all if you are not able to communicate to the person for who the committee was intended to actually improve the quality of work. Yeah, and please. we need to get down to that person. That's very, very important. Uh, similarly, yeah. what uh, Harish ji was saying about uh, technology and uh, Dr. Paul also said about technology to avoid medication errors. Uh, well, EMR is a perfect solution if you can prescribe, if you can make a prescription electronically. I mean, I did that around 15 years ago in Australia. We're not still doing it in Fortex even now, right now yeah. as well today. But the reality is that we will take another two or three decades for it to be integrated in the entire country. So there again, communication becomes a problem. And point problem is that none of us are taught to communicate in the medical school or the nursing school. We are extremely poor communicators. Some of us pick up and hone the communication skills and we come forward and we are able to tell what is in our mind. Most nurses and doctors struggle to communicate, sir. 
and that's when these errors happen so the chloro becomes chloroquine because that nurse who was reading it as chloro probably did not talk about that this is not chloroquine this is chloro and you know this is these are the simple things which we we may retrospectively find so easy that it was so easily correctable but moving forward we have not taught them how to communicate and now we expect them to communicate completely so every aspect whether it is clinical aspect within the doctors and nurses or more importantly with the families 40% to 50% of my time every day sir is talking with families and i'm sure most clinicians do that i yes. only do half half of my time clinical half of my time is communicator yes. i'm a i'm a able communicator as well as i'm a able clinician wonderful harish i th- i think they have answered most of the points i don't think i should be adding anything more than what they've spoken about on this topic okay uh let me uh, touch another Please. another aspect now uh with most hospitals uh, i would safely say more than 50 60 or even 70% of the hospitals still relying very heavily on paper on uh, non uh, uh, not only non digital but if you go into the interiors uh, non computerized records uh forget emr where even uh, your basic billing is done handwritten what are one two three four five steps beginning with you anish rahul paul and then coming back to you uh harish what would be a message to investors doctors clinicians administrators that going digital is the only way forward if you want to sustain healthcare mainly in india over to you anish sir i'll start with investors please sir, yes madam yes the investors would need to understand and take cognizance that 85% of healthcare in india gdp expenditure is privately funded and 70% of that happens in small cities and in smaller setups and most of these setups as dr bhaga you have rightly said are not forget digitized some of them do not have a desktop or a laptop even in today's state yeah so so that is a huge opportunity for business startups extending old businesses into new areas understanding what works there yeah. now i would go so sir that is the space explored needs to be explored tapped this needs an affordable but scalable ehr which is modular with patient safety at its heart yeah next i would go to the doctors we doctors we are very busy most of us are actually we are running from one patient to one patient in a busy hospital often time typing again is something we did not learn in medical school and often time some of us type actually very slow today is the world of change a lot of ehrs even these are not to the investors also please integrate voice as a powerful tool in your ehr and emr what do i do when i go to the bedside i tell my senior registrar or the resident that these are the things that you must do these are my orders till my next visit so the moment these are used in a voice command which is translated into a written command this can be pushed to multiple departments to and improve the patient care number 3 regarding the nurses you must and you and they must i feel i feel be more and more comfortable and adopt the digital whole heartedly why cannot why they shouldn't because i see even rickshaw pullers today if taking out their smartphones i am seeing a lot of people today taking out their phones and browsing through movies facebooks and everything so then why can a physician not carry all his patient record in his mobile we should so the ehr emrs must extend to our if i had a bad report i should be able to see it real time in my mobile at that same time so that is my message to the nurses this has a thumb operation which recognizes i do not need to put a thumb is digitized here if my digital signature from mudra is integrated here then i can simply order like somebody has a potassium of 5.6 i don't need to see that patient i need to talk with my resident see the dashboard in the mobile and then immediately order even if i am sitting in the opd start the calcium gluconate i am on my way so that is how it should be in today's world sir so that is my message to them rahul 
So, sir, uh, I am completely in for technology. I am just going to talk about the other side of it because I still continue to work in a system. Uh, every year, I have spent around four weeks in Australia. Yeah. Um, you know, you become a victim of outstanding medicine. Uh, exactly like Dr. Anish said, I don't need to see the patient. I can order from home. You are outstanding intensivist because you never enter the cubicle. You do everything from outside. That's a, that's a problem with that. So clinical examination takes a back seat. You start missing out on things. So I think that, that balance is very difficult. I've seen systems where, where they have gone overboard with technology. Everything is to be backed up with technology. I think uh, there is a devil side to that as well. If you just rely completely on technology, some parts are mandatory, like medication error, absolutely mandatory. But I think treatment protocols still need to be actually conveyed at the bedside. That's the only thing which I would like to add. And this is not being disrespectful to what Dr. Banerjee said. This was just, I took an example of what he said. This, I have seen it happen many times in, in, the, in, in Australia, where they would stand at the end of the bed and for days together, no consultant has actually gone inside and examined the patient. It's all nurse examination and you sort of look at the x-ray, look at the films, look at the blood reports and chart a treatment plan. 99% of the time it works. That 1% fall, falls into the crack somewhere. Dr. Ra Dr. Rahul, the, sorry, uh, I would take this. Dr. Rahul, the example that I gave is one of a hyperkalemia in a patient where know, the ECG I, I, is showing a polypic T. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know Dr. Anish. It was so not that patient, that patient cannot wait for you to walk a kilometer from your opinion I, to your ear. I, I don't right. think you got the message. It was not meant to be critical for you. I'm just giving an example that this is exactly what happened. Yeah. He was not being critical in spite of being in critical care, but there's a humorous side to what uh, he right. said is that these days doctors are so outstanding that they keep standing out. Patients are so... <laughs> no, sir. Patients, a patient's mental picture can only be had by sitting yeah. in the bedside and assessing the patient. But yeah. what, prevent, what can prevent a loss of life is understanding and accepting that 5.6 potassium. We should go unrecognized till morning in a current day non-digital non setup. Here at the 5.6 potassium will give 10 alarms to 10 concerned people. Do something about it. Do something about it. In a physical system, the lab technician probably does not understand the importance of 5.6 potassium and maybe 6 potassium. He will simply say, okay, I will release that report in the morning next day. So that is the beauty of a digital system on the flip side, sir. Yeah. No, of course, of course, uh, there is no doubt about that, uh, Dr. Anish, and I don't want to again uh, get into that argument, but I think there is a place for technology for these things. I have no doubt about that in my mind. It's just that when it comes to the bedside medicine, we still need to integrate the art of medicine because there's so much art in medicine that needs to marry with the technology to have a good outcome. Agreed. Agreed I, on that. Agreed on I that think, point. I think it's the, it's the pilot and not the Boeing uh, aircraft. It's ultimately the, the man behind the machine and I think very strongly that technology is an aid to bring doctors closer towards patients not to take them away from patients. Yes, yes, uh, yes. That's, that's really the... Uh, the sir, one the more point. So one more point, yeah. if I may. So there is one place for technology which can act as a safety net. So the rural India, the Bharat, which we talked about just some time ago, requires a digital technology which can be assessed from a smartphone like what we call as an EICU concept or an e-medicine concept. But that cannot be the primary concept. You still need a physician at the place who will, who will be helped by the experts at a distance. And these experts and the net technology will act as a safety net. It will not be the primary treating net. I think that's what we need to realize that there is a lot scope for technology, but how you place it and how you recognize it is important. So I believe, sir, the way telemedicine is being practiced in this country is wonderful because it mandates that one doctor has to collaborate with a senior colleague to deliver medical care. So we have not depended on nurse practitioners legally in India. So it is always a senior colleague suggesting a junior colleague in telemedicine in India. I believe there is a very right way of looking at things, sir. Uh, Dr. Paul, we've touched the topic of uh, telemedicine, which is e-health or uh, connectivity from uh, one place to remote areas. Uh, throw some light on telemedicine, e-health, teleradiology, telepathology, 
um, stabilizing a patient through uh, technology in remote areas before uh, advanced care can reach a patient. Over to you, Dr. Paul. So we, uh, to begin with, we relied, we decided to go forward since we were so electronic, uh, pardon me for using the word electronic, I will take probably 30 seconds to to digress into the previous discussion, which about outstanding. So that was one thing that was always a fear factor for me, that mm -hmm. technology would replace the human touch. So we took several steps to get past that, one of which was to use transcribers to help the doctors uh, uh, clerk the patient's notes so that this whole syndrome that now exists in the West where the doctor is looking at the monitor and not looking at the patient was taken out. So we took lots of steps. But at the same time, on the flip side, we, look, we started with telemedicine. With What we did was I personally traveled to West Bengal where Dr. Anish, I believe, practices. I went to remote parts of West Bengal, places like, uh, uh, I can't even remember the names now, so we are in touch with about 10 hospitals in West Bengal. I just got back from a trip to Agartala, Meghalaya, Assam, and um, Nagaland last week. And we're trying to work with the governmental agencies to set up a telemedicine facility. But here, let me tell you, my primary focus was, because we are in a very peculiar setting in Vellore, lots of patients come to Vellore from the Northeast. Yeah. Some come looking for a specific hospital or a doctor. Some patients are just walk-ins. Now, a person who is referred by a doctor in Agartala goes back to that doctor for further treatment. So let me take my specialty as a brain surgeon. A patient walks in for surgery with a referral letter, and I finish the surgery, seven days he goes back to Agartala. In the discharge report, it says, review after three months, which I think is an absolutely inhumane thing to do. This patient is going to come back three months later to see me for exactly five minutes. And I write at the bottom, repeat anti-epileptic medications for three more months. And I say, review again. There's nothing else if the patient is fine. So what we thought of was something known as the reverse referral system, which is what we are trying to set up in Naruvi hospitals now, which means to say that we are trying to identify groups of doctors in the periphery who we can initially work with, get our culture driven into them. So I might have a certain way of handling epilepsy or post-operative patients. That, you know, somebody else's methods may be different. So if I'm going to send a patient back to another surgeon for follow-up, I need to know what his thoughts on post-operative management are. So we first chat up with each other. We create a memorandum of understanding. We invite them over to Vello, come and see our work culture. Hereafter, if I get a patient from any part of Tripura, I am going to refer this patient to you unless he has a specific choice of a physician to go back to, which makes it a lot easier because in India, you know, medical treatment is, a, is more of a festival. For the treatment of one person, 10 people come along. So it's a whole disruption of family, work, yeah. a lot of money spent. If follow-ups, I would say tell my focus on telemedicine is primarily as a follow-up measure and not as a primary modality of treatment or as a prelude to asking them whether to come or not to come. Trying to end treatment or even use somebody else's hands. I am not yet there. Although now there are devices available. There are otoscopes which you can use sitting remotely. There are dermatoscopes you can use sitting remotely. Yeah. But we are primarily using it for reverse reference, which means that we treat and then we try to avoid the patients the hassle of coming back time and time again. So that's my take on telemedicine as of now. We are still infants in this because this hospital is less than a year old. So we've got miles to go before we sleep. Teleradiology, over teleradiology, we have one of the pioneers in teleradiology. Um, she is the one who started teleradiology in a big way in South India for Columbia Asia group. 
she heads our radiology off-site team. So we have already enrolled a few clients for teleradiology. One is in Indonesia, one is in Myanmar. That, I think, is just a blind man's guess. It just works like most of the time it works reasonably well. I think that's that's a taken thing. Okay. Telepathology, oh. yeah. unfortunately, telepathology was something I wanted very badly. But the investment at the client end is huge. It costs about two crore rupees to buy a decent slide scanner so that the images that are transferred to our central station is of high quality. We have a very extensive pathology department with people retired from CMC Velour. We have about seven different pathology subspecialties. But unfortunately, the images we get are not sufficient enough for a proper reporting structure. So the cost, we looked at various options. Some smaller operators were coming up with modified equipment that had little digital cameras fitted onto the top of microscopes and things like that. But they were suboptimal and probably would compromise on the quality of the report, which we did not want to get into. Okay. Rahul, very quickly tell me, what would be the legal fallouts of uh, telemedicine going forward? I think uh, with COVID and the scare of people to travel, visit hospitals, visit clinics, uh, more and more people. In fact, uh, the U.S. data has shown a uh, hundred percent increase from thirty percent going up to almost fifty-two to sixty percent people relying on uh, some form of e-health or e-medicine. What would be the implications as far as the medical legal aspects are concerned? Because very clearly, there would be areas which a patient would be required, and it may fall through the cracks in telemedicine more out of convenience rather than by choice. Rahul, over to you. Correct, correct, sir. At the moment, I think the Supreme Court as well as the medical councils have actually promoted the use of uh, technology to have e-medicine, and that was obviously yeah. to do with to deal with the COVID, COVID pandemic. But there would be fallouts, and we are still in the very nascent stage of actually understanding how the fallouts would happen. <laughs> But yeah. there would be times where we would miss out on uh, diagnosis. There would be time when we would miss out on glaring treatment opportunities, which could have changed the patient's outcome. I think uh, it's going to be a new learning for all of us, just like we learned how to deal with paper. Now we are going to learn how to deal with technology and plug up those gaps. Uh, there is there is already a software backup which keeps on sort of promoting, prompting us to uh, avoid those type of errors. But I think the human error uh, the lack of human touch will actually still be a problem and that i don't know how we'll be able to club so we need doctor at the other end also on whom you can reliably and uh, you know you can re you can rely on his, his examination <laughs> skills his um, uh, procedural skills perhaps or his uh, communication skills at times and then okay. add on to that it cannot replace at the moment in country like india it's going to be very difficult to replace them. harish your inputs in this I think I fully agree with Dr. Rahul. I think we can't have that replacement as a as a need to run behind it. I think it just start off and I think it has started off. COVID has accelerated it. But is it in the right direction? Yes. How long will it take and where is the destination is a question mark, which I believe. What would be the parameters uh, uh, beginning with you, Rahul, when you talk in terms of giving quality of care and which has been made transparent to a patient and the patient's family. So when you say I'm giving the best care, are you talking only of standardized care? Are you talking of quality care? What are the parameters you would discuss with the family when the patient comes to you? I think uh, so. The, I think it's a combination of uh, both of them. You need to have a quality as well as you need to have excellence. And we need to be very, very transparent with uh, what options we are discussing with the patient. And then you need to still give them the best possible options and then leave it for them to decide. That's one way of looking at it. Secondly, yeah. if your decision is challenged, there is nothing, nothing bad to feel about. If they want to take a second opinion or if they want to have another person to look into the files, I think you should. your clinical assessment should be so robust that I can say this is the paper, this is the file, you go to any place and uh, and show this. Uh, I always guide a patient's family that if you want to show this, this would be a kind of doctors I would have gone myself to take a second opinion, not name yeah. them, but you know, there's no point for an ICU consult to go to a general practitioner and take an opinion. 
I would say you go to any other intensivist of the of the city or the country, and you take an opinion. I would like to be, uh, you know, happy for uh, for you to do that. I think that's that kind of independence has to be also there for the patient and the patient's family. Gone are the days when doctor was a member of the family and would just decide on the patient's uh, relatives and outcome. But at the same time, we need to guide them in the right way and leave the final decision for them to take. Harish, when you are uh, setting up a system like from your company. how would that be integrated in running hospitals protocols that means a hospital already has a pre designed or a pre existing uh, it base uh, solution it can be an indian or a multinational company uh, some have gone completely digital and uh, how would a pre existing system absorb add ons of technology in a running hospital over to you harish thank you sir i i think it's again a pretty challenging question um just to uh, put it across in context when you look at a, a hospital they have their own systems and i think one of the classic elements which came in in the last discussion also was end of the day the physicians know the patients better they are trying to render the care they need to make the decision it's not the technology which will make a decision technology will only be able to aid in making a decision the same way when a protocol is made and there is a systems which are being followed whether it is on a electronic one or a non electronic one there are many places where you can get that commitment and that communication which we said about getting the alignment of various uh, caregivers into that yeah. specific system so you could identify those specific topics have those clearly aligned have that running through if you find those topics to be correct because the scientific committee which sits on a hospital will probably be able to clearly agree upon which is working for their set of protocols what they believe those can be made now if you are going towards electronic these can be made electronically available there you can put it in in places where there is a lack of this there are technology where available there are pathways which are available which is part of what uh, uh, i'm sorry i'm talking of a product called up to date advanced here but that's has pathways available and the reason for pathways made out of these diseases are because if you challenge it the care variability comes specifically to the regular or what you see in day to day and if you can arrest them that typically would arrest around 80% of them so those are also available but the choice is completely left to the hospital to the management to the uh, care providers what works well if they have one they can find what is the relevant ones and give it linked up even to the level where if an hospital is if a, let's say an emr is giving an alert now i'm sorry i'm moving on to the technology part of it an emr is giving an alert but as a physician he it's all his rights as the person to think through even in spite of that he still believes that he should go with it which is should be given a choice he can make a check box give a link to the specific articles and everything i mean of course taking time at that point at the point of care you might not read the entire article it should be able to give, go through quickly go through the summary align yes no and then even if he overrules it the emr will be also able to back it up because the same thing would be stored at the emr end so there is an audit trail also available so there's a good amount of introspection which you could do later and you will be able to bring a standardization to a better level that's my take on it sir dr paul what would be some areas where clinicians would be aided by on ground instant uh data help uh let's say in the emergency room operation theater lab radiology with devices which can give us quick access uh to multi dimensional specialties being integrated thank you sir so we as i said we have an up and running up to date on all our terminals across the hospital and on all the personal devices that the doctors uh carry around with them and if i'm not wrong mr harish our usage is still not optimal i don't think we crossed 25% even with this available freely and i keep telling them i keep sending mails to all the doctors that this is available we paid so many number of rupees for this please use it because if you don't use it it goes to waste our user uh, platform i don't think is more than 25% so it's i i think there has to be a culture change and if i may to be allowed to agree with dr robert rahul dr rahul said it has to come from within you know, it it comes out of a desire to do the best 
And then, even if you don't have it in your pocket, um, let me go back to your days, the senior most person on the days, Dr. Bagai, and then Dr. Pandit and I probably would be about the same vintage. What did we do in our days when we did our thesis? We went and dusted out the um, uh, those um, uh, index medicuses. We sneezed yeah. for days together and did our thesis. So we, where we there is a will, there is a way. We've all gone through the midline search and going through libraries and realizing that particular cross-reference journal has already been borrowed by someone else. And perhaps that page itself is missing. You know? And then you find out who took it and then you go back yeah. to the library and find that guy, call him and say, can I have it back? So yeah. where there is a will, there is a way. Technology Absolutely. alone, no matter what it does, as I, Dr. Harish rightly said, it, there's a checkbox option to override it. I think uh, Dr. Paul has very kindly put me in the super geriatric group. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm so sorry, sir. I'm so sorry, sir. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's, uh, it's all because of the lack of hair, you know, which gives my age. <laughs> and uh, age in apparent and respect, excess. Age and respect, unfortunately, are linked. And we respect you so much that it's kind of linked to age. I think it is boosted because of the third vaccine <laughs> discussion. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rahul, how does how do things where you can get quick access with better care decrease the real risk of uh, medical legal cases and complications which are filed uh, against the hospitals? Uh, and being, yeah. in, uh, being an admin personally now for more than two and a half decades, and built and commissioned about five hospitals in Delhi and CR. Uh, I have only seen the number of cases of litigation expand multifold. A vast majority of them are uh, fraudulent, I must add. They are mischievous and they are only ill intended by trying not to pay the full bill or to try to recover some excess money which is illegally never due to them. But Transparency, of course. Doctor communication, of course. But how does this technology in real time, in terms of uh, uh, clinical practice, decrease the real risk of medical legal complications? Absolutely, sir. I think uh, any access to a technology, which will perhaps, let's say, let's take the example of uh, clinical guidelines. Let's take the yeah. most common ICU guideline, which is the surviving sepsis guideline. Yeah. So 30 ml per kilo fluid to be given for a patient who comes in with septic shock. That's one of the first you know, guideline number two, which is there, that you identify a septic and sepsis, you give 30 ml per kilo. So it's a very good leveler. If you follow that guideline, most patients will get 25 to 30 ml per kilo fluid within the first one to two hours. Then yeah. there will be no challenge. You know, if tomorrow it goes to court, tomorrow it goes for an expert opinion, tomorrow it goes for anything, you would say that you followed the uh, surviving sepsis guideline of 30 ml per kilo. Yeah. Where it goes wrong is, sir, that it also becomes a, a recipe for mediocrity. While it's a very good leveler, it Excellent. sometimes sometimes blunts your thinking that this yeah. patient has a cardiac uh, element as well. He's got a 10% ejection fraction. I'm going to yeah. give him 30 ml per kilo fluid and I'm going to drown him in fluid now. So that yeah. kind of a thing, when it happens, that's when you fall into the cracks. So while uh, guidelines and technology are good, they level up everybody. They bring you up to say, suppose the uh, 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 standard of care is 95% or 80% or 90%. It will bring you to 90%. But that top 10% is the expertise of the doctor. And, and many times, majority of the doctors and nurses think that 90% is what we have to achieve, not 100%. And that becomes the recipe for mediocrity. That's where the problem is. And it happens not only with doctors, it's in up, across, across the industry. It could be in technology, it could be in healthcare, it could be in uh, food, food and beverage industry, it could be in hospitality. We just want to touch the benchmark and say we have achieved everything. Nobody wants to strive to go beyond the benchmark and be be super excellent. Absolutely, uh, Harish. How do how do these technologies uh, uh, convert into costing for a hospital which is already pre-existing? How does the format run for you as an organization? Would you be looking at one hospital at a time? Would you be looking at X number of consultants at a time? Would you be looking at the number of hours of usage 
per month uh, how would you uh, how would you uh, how, let me rephrase it how would you give a proposal to a hospital to say that listen this is an excellent technology it's going to help you no end it's cost effective so i'm coming down to cost effectiveness a very varied subject now there are multiple different things one is like you have up to date which is a clinical decision support tool or you have a clinical drug reference solution or if you're really looking at an automated patient specific alert uh, management which is medication i think every one of them has a very different way but typically bulb i think in a, in a, in a clinical setup i think as walter school we would look at clinical effectiveness we look at how many physicians are there what are the different types of physicians too because we don't go back and make sure everybody but let's take the example now nurses nurses are a very important part of the caregiving uh, segment and so when we look at it we want them to also access it and like what dr posit it's again left to them how we i mean when i say we we as a company and we as physicians as the as a institution how do we drive them to adopt on it so there are different elements which are considered overall it varies from a small hospital with very number, very different types of physicians different types of nurses to a large hospital it all varies but it is pretty much standardized there is not much of a discrepancy which comes inside when you talk of pricing so i'm not talking in an absolute dollar because that will be very difficult to yeah. pinpoint but it is pretty much standardized and we also take into effect like what i mentioned these different other people so if there is one solution being implemented and second solution being added that means that we are going towards a different way of taking it that again for us when from an implementation standpoint from a structural standpoint it changes our costing overall i think it is good in in a way when i look at india i think the good point and i think let's probably good at the positive points also there are many institutions today who have got into it and i think dr paul did mention about his institution being using it and we constantly try to see how we can do it and plus we also help and support in integration because i think going further whether we like it like what dr rao mentioned probably 5 years down the line i would love to see it or 10 years let i don't know i don't want to put the number of years when it comes into integration we are probably the first to sit down and say talk to those emr vendors and the best part is you don't need to have only those high end emrs even the home grown emrs like dr paul was mentioning they have a home grown emr these technology can be integrated we work with them we try to do that also so the dollar alone on one side could be there but i think the ways which we do it and we bring it in is much more different so it's a pretty bigger scale of uh, things which i would talk about wonderful uh, dr paul when you have inculcated technology in your organization how do you track the cost versus benefit so the reason of asking this question is when we uh, the, the the latest hospital which i set up 2 years back was uh, according to me now reaching him stage 6 uh, it's perhaps uh, within delhi and cr one of the most digitally enhanced uh, hospitals you know with the uh, with i suites with uh, uh, voice control with uh, completely paperless of course uh but uh, various dimensions in which uh, technology is gone leaps and bounds now before this was put to the investors everyone said that you know this is going to cost much more than a typical uh broad based running standardly used hospital his system and i always say that any technology which is aiding four basic criteria better clinical outcomes better operational excellence better patient safety and better patient experience it makes sense and i always said keeping these four points in in the background is that any technology which is used or digital format is is used is never an expense it's an investment so what we did is we very smartly for the first one year tracked actually the an amount of delta which we put in extra over and above a, a robust his and saw what were the gains what we got and very surprisingly it was a 19% roi which according to me is more than most of the hospitals clinical rois over to you paul so we are still as i told you sir we are still uh, very very uh, young in our journey we are only about 10 months old yet yeah so what the, the kind of decision the philosophy based decision that i took because there was a lot of resistance when i said that this emr is going to cost so much 
we looked at various important systems and we looked at the Indian system. <coughs> and then we looked at the uh, Walters Kluwer product. So what I did to start with, although a finance team said, Dr. Henry, this is not going to work the way you want it to work. It's not a profit center. I said, exactly. It is not a profit center. It is not a profit center. We need to look at the overall culture because medicine at the end of the day is a culture. I am a third generation doctor. So my grandfather was a doctor. My mother was a doctor. I am a doctor. And I've seen the decline in the culture of the medical profession over the last 56 years, of which I could probably remember about 46. I've seen the decline in the culture. And I think it is our bounded duty to try and put back into the medical profession what that culture was all about. And I think sometimes it's important not to only look at the profit center part. And I believe that some of these tools like the library, the digital or the physical library, uh, the EMR system, these are investments towards a philosophy and a culture of care. But the whole challenge comes when you're trying to put that in place after buying all of this, as I was telling you, our use is only probably about 25%. Now, how do we up that? And I think the only answer there is we've started conducting CMEs every week and we're getting CME points. It's just a bone under the table. And I still don't think 90% of the people who come there, come there to improve patient quality or patient care. They come there to accrue points. Genomic sequencing, next gen sequencing, NSG. A lot of hospitals have started using this. Some of them have outsourced it to running uh, uh, established labs. How do we integrate genomics? I'm not talking only in the context of COVID, and I'm not talking in context of mutational sequencing, but to give you an example, you will see patients who've been on um, drugs like Dilantin or Tegretol or uh, Atenolol for blood pressure or ACE inhibitors or ARBs. And then for years together, the patient is taking it and then you'll add a second drug. Then you'll add a triple combination, not realizing perhaps that patient is not going to react to it because that patient genetically is not going to be able to react to the drug. How does genomics in clinical practice, how is it going to pan out for a country like India in the next 10 years? Very quickly, Rahul. Rahul, then yep. Dr. Paul, and then uh, Harish. Sir, I am actually, uh, you know, I have been trying to do complete my PhD on proteomics uh, in sepsis. And I think it's Fantastic. time that we will actually have... Um, uh, signature genes, we will have genome sequencing for common diseases, which we which we don't even think of today. So how is a patient going to react with sepsis? Who is going to have a gram negative septicemia and going to go down very quickly? And who is going to be probably resilient? I'll give a 10 second explanation. I take to yeah. 20 samples from, from doctors who are working with me in Australia. And yeah. we, uh, we separated the serum, placed it with, uh, with the E. coli. And then we did a uh, assessment of the uh, cytokines in that. And I was mm -hmm. surprised to know that six of us who were Indians out of those 20 samples had no reaction to the cytokines. The cytokines did not go up at all, whereas all the 14 Caucasians and Asians had a huge cytokine surge in their serum, uh, which, which was you know quite surprising. We presented this data, and I probably give this data as uh, you know, explanation that as a child, all six of us Indians were probably exposed to this strain of E. coli, which the, the Caucasians and the Asians were not. I think we will be required to do a gene sequencing. Time will come in 10 years' time, sir. Perhaps in my uh, fag end of the practice in another 10 or 15 years, where somebody will, some smart resident or doctor will tell me, he's gene KY21, you need to give him meropenem, not piperacillin tazobactam. That's how it's going to work, sir. Rahul is being very kind and he's not mentioning my age this time. Huh? <laughs> Can I try I to think, <laughs> I think, I, I, no, no, I'm just joking, Rahul. I, I'm sure that in all our lifetimes, we, we should see it. We must see it. I'm a very strong believer that uh, 
Uh, genomics is the way uh, drug policies are going to be decided. Drug usage and choice will be decided and doses will be decided. Not only antibiotics, but a lot of other chronic care medication. It should include for diabetes, for epilepsy, for Alzheimer's, for dementia and so on and so forth. Dr. Paul and then Dr. Harish. Honestly speaking, as a surgeon, I would let this question pass. Um, okay. okay. So that, that's where I would leave my case. Okay, okay. Uh, Harish, uh, what about integration of, uh, of uh, genomics in uh, technology which you have on board? I think you really gave me the right to that part to answer because I think what Dr. Rahul was talking was probably much higher than what I can think of. But pharmacogenomics as a part has been incorporated into our clinical drug reference solution already and the ref and when i say it when i when i refer to something is being included in our thing and i think the underlying fact will remain that it'll all be evidence backed so the yeah. evidence medicine evidence backed everything will be there so which means to say somebody who wants to go inside and find it out it also helps them so lexicom which is a drug reference solution it already includes pharmacogenomics but like what dr rahul mentioned i think it's going to take a little more time there's going to be more developments and things coming in. This is going to be probably one of the biggest things when it will start moving into that specific one. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I think it's been wonderful chatting with everyone. It's been an hour and a half since we've uh, almost got to know each other's ages, uh, except uh, mine. <laughs> good, good meeting with everyone. Thank you, Sudhata. It's been wonderful. Thank you everyone. It has been a very engaging conversation and uh, I will be sending across the questions that there are a lot of questions which have come in. I'll be sending across the questions to each one of you and uh, look forward to further engaging conversations like this. Thank you Dr. Bagai for wonderful. steering this conversation wonderful. so wonderfully.